I'm the executive director of Amnesty International in Ireland at the moment. Prior to that, I was a psychotherapist. I founded a national organization in the UK and then here in Ireland that supports women and men who've experienced sexual violence. I've been a senator. I've made documentary films that have gone around the world. I've written a best-selling memoir. I've done lots of interesting, exciting things in my life that I suppose when I look back, of, back on, I can see that's been a, a real level of achievement. I'm also married to an amazing man. We've been together for 17 years. We've got two extraordinary kids. I'm a very lucky, uh, a very happy uh, um, uh, uh, man, so I'm blessed. When I was 17, though, um, I was homeless on the streets of Dublin. When I was 17, uh, I was suicidal, depressed, desperate, broken, frightened, and completely disconnected from any idea of, of who I was or who I might be. I'd been abused for, a, for about three years by a, by a Roman Catholic priest in County Wexford, where I'm from. And ultimately, that abuse led to me being in that kind of state and finally running from my family, running from my home, because if I didn't, I couldn't have stayed on the planet. I had to run away. For about the next 10 years of my life, I kept running, I suppose, in a way, until I started to stop running. And then it, it all kind of caught up with me in some ways, and I began to think about the things that had happened to me earlier in my life. And as I thought about them, I realized that I had to do something about them because they were wrong. Now, I didn't even really understand what had happened to me at that stage, but I knew that if I, if I acknowledged what had happened to me when I was 14, 15, 16, and 17 years of age, that it was wrong and that something had to be done about it. And I struggled with that for about a year before I finally decided what to do. I came back, I was living in London at that stage. I came back to Ireland in 1995, made a statement to the guards, and that led to an investigation about what had happened to me. And a whole lot of other stuff emerged. I found out that the person who had abused me for all of those years had been abusing a, an awful lot of other uh, boys at the time as well. And then as time went by, I found out that the church had known about it, that the authorities had known about it, that the Vatican had known about it. And all of these discoveries, all of these things that I found out, just made me realize or, or recognize a, a scale of wrongdoing, a scale of injustice that just shocked me. Uh, and I waited to see what somebody would do about it. And it didn't look like anybody was doing very much at all about it. The guards were investigating, that was great, but nobody seemed to be asking the, the bigger questions that needed to be asked. The, when I found out about just how much had been known about what was happening, when I found out about how long it had been going on, nobody was asking. So I started to ask the questions. And that led to me uh, uh, going on and training as a psychotherapist. That led to me then working with other people who had had experiences of sexual violence to try and support them as I understood what was possible when we sit down and look for the support that we need or when we look to give ourselves the support that we need, I began to recognize what was possible. That also led to me, for instance, suing the Pope. Uh, um, uh, which was something I, I did in, in 1998. It led to then the first ever investigation, making a film with the BBC, the first ever investigation into child sexual abuse in the Roman Catholic Church in a diocese here in Ireland, the Ferns Inquiry, the Ferns Report. All of this stuff way predates you, but I'm, I'm mentioning it for a reason. But at, at every step that I made the decisions that I made to do the things that I did, it wasn't because I had this really well-informed, well-thought-out strategy of what needed to happen and what might be next. Instead, it was because when I found something out that bothered me, that disturbed me, that when I looked at it, I realized was deeply wrong, was unjust, simply could not be allowed to stand. There was something about, there was, I was lucky enough to have something in myself that then compelled me to do something about it. Um, the, 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 uh, the title for my talk was, was, was How You Can Change the World. And I suppose if I were to, to break down the ways in which I think we all, there's nothing extraordinary about me. Nothing more extraordinary there is about any of you. We are all extraordinary. To be human is to be extraordinary. Uh, and, and the real question is, can we find within ourselves and within the circles of support that we have around us the opportunity to make real everything that is extraordinary about each one of us? The ways in which I ended up doing things that changed my life, that changed the life of people around me, that changed the laws in this country, that changed the natures of the kinds of conversations that we have in this country, and it really did, was by asking myself a simple question each time that I had to confront a challenge. What is right? What do I know? 
What do, I, what do I know about what's simply right or wrong? And if I honestly allow myself to acknowledge what's wrong, what am I, what am I uh, compelled to do about it? And I really believe that at the heart of what it means to be human is a desire uh, to live life in a way that's healthy and joyous and loving and life-affirming and positive and, and, and progressive, always moving on, always engaging, always looking for the next moment to be more, more of who we might be. Um, and too often uh, in our lives, we're told that we don't have to be more, we have to be less. So the way in which I believe you can change the world is by looking to yourself. So in the moments where you face challenge, look to what you know, look to what you feel. We all know what's right. We all know what's just. And when you see wrong, name it. When you see wrong, whether it's being done to yourself or to somebody else, take it personally. Recognize that you both have the power and the opportunity to do something about it. And when we name wrong, we begin to change it. When we challenge it, we begin to change it. Because the simple reality is, as I said earlier on, I honestly believe at the heart of what it means to be human is a desire to express that in, the, in ways in which are positive and healthy and life-affirming and loving. And sometimes that requires us to open up difficult conversations that other people might not want to have. And at times, that's the right and proper and loving thing to do. Um, and I suppose the other thing that I'd just like to say is, when you, when you, when you approach uh, uh, life in that way or challenge in that way, it doesn't just enrich your society or, or your community. It's not about doing you know, what's, what's good so that other people can see it. It's not about what you might achieve. It's not about, you know, plaudits and being celebrated and being told you're brave or courageous or any of that stuff, even though that's nice if people want to affirm you in that way. What it's really about is being true to yourself. What it's really about is recognizing that when we stand for goodness, when we stand for humanity, when we stand for justice, and when we stand for what's right, we become more and more and more of ourselves. It's not just good for our world, it's not just good for people around us. I promise you one thing, it will be the most fulfilling, self-realizing, empowering thing you can ever do. So essentially, the way that you can change the world is by being fully, authentically, absolutely yourself. And when people tell you that you are defined by, by how you are in a moment, whether it's like I was when I was 17 by being depressed, by having an eating disorder, by being desperate, by not knowing where to turn next. That is not who you are. That might be where you are in a moment, but it is not who you are. What defines us are not the things that happen to us in our lives. Rather, what defines us is how we respond to them, how we take on those challenges, how we find a way through it, how we openly, lovingly look for support from other people, use that and then offer it to others too. So everybody in this room has the power within themselves to change their world. And if you do it, you will be uh, uh, more of yourself, you will realize much more fully who you are, and you will live lives that are fulfilling and loving and empowering and exciting. And I really encourage each and every one of you to do so, and we need you to do so. Uh, the next generation of change, ma change makers for our country and for our world are in this room. I hope that's why you're here today, because that's what motivates you to be parts of these kinds of conversations. And we need you to do that. So look to yourselves, look to your hearts, be confident in your own knowing and understanding of what's right, and then act on that. And at, at, at its heart, that's what Amnesty International is about. Since 1961, we've been looking to name injustice, and we've been asking other people to take it personally. And I need to close, because we're running out of time, but in one regard, then, I would ask you to do one thing for me. When you go home this evening, go to amnesty.ie and look for uh, the case of Ibrahim Halawa, a young Irish man, 20 years of age now, arrested when he was 17. He's been unlawfully detained in an Egyptian prison now for more than three years. We cannot allow that to stand. Everybody in this room can do something about that. So stand up, speak out, name what's wrong, demand change and change the world. Thanks very much indeed.